and right now there's a book coming out called the genetic book of the dead yes what's is, does this have a subtitle what's the subtitle uh on? yes it does have a subtitle a darwinian reverie so tell me about this okay. book i haven't read it yet um if you say, if you look at a uh a, a highly camouflaged animal a, de a desert lizard it's one that i use it's got pebbles and sand all over its back it's just a, a dummy painting of a desert on its back okay so um that is a description of the world in which its ancestors lived. You can read that animal as a book describing the desert world in which its ancestors lived. Now that's an easy example because it's got it painted on its back, but it must be true right the way through every bit of the, every cell of the animal, every molecule of the animal has got the same uh, description written. And some of it is baggage, baggage as in burdensome rather than- Yes, but- we have an appendix that can burst. That's true. You have a pinky toe. When was the last time you made good use of that? Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is that natural selection is very, very fussy, is very, very um, intricate in its, in its choice, far more than we, we, we even know about. We are poor judges of what's important for survival. And you think that the genes that survive, going back to the selfish gene, the genes that survive have to survive through lots and lots of different individuals and through a huge amount of geological time. And so any statistical estimate that you and I make about the likelihood that your pinky will be of any use to you is a statistical mistake. Natural selection is a much better statistician than, than we are. So I'd need to think harder about my pinky toe. Well, natural selection has millions of years in which to choose between successful toes and unsuccessful toes. A, a feature like a toe, something that seems trivial to, to, to you. And he said, let's allow that it's so trivial that for every thousand individuals who have it and survive, 999 die. This feature, the toe, whatever it is, as being re repeated thousands of times in lots of different in individuals and through lots of different th millions of, y of years. And it's got to survive through all those times. The, the main point is that we are very bad estimators of what's important uh, in natural selection is a, is a much better estimator of that. Okay, how about male pattern baldness? <laughs> Well, you got that one. <laughs> well, th that, that's that's a variable. I mean, some people have it and some right. people don't. You you might take another example, um, maybe fingerprints. Um, why why do we have fingerprints? Well, the, the fact that they're different doesn't matter. But do, are they important for clinging onto the trees when we were, you know, had our mm. boreal ancestors? That kind of thing. Um, oh, I see. So even if they're not useful now, they were useful to get us to where they are, we are now. Hence the genetic book of the dead. I mean, we're, we're talking, oh, about the, talking about the past. Damn, you're right. There it is. The genetic book of the dead. Yes. Enabling us to get to where we are at all. Yes. We are, we are a description of the worlds in which our dead ancestors survived until they, until they died. <laughs> <laughs> survived and long be, enough to reproduce. Because if we didn't survive, we'd, go, we'd be extinct and we wouldn't be here to talk about it in modern times. We well, are only here because our ancestors survived long enough, long enough to reproduce. Yes. Do you have hope for a civilization as it's currently manifested in the world? I think we have to have hope to, to live our lives at all. It doesn't mean that at an intellectual level I necessarily have, have but I, 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 I live my life as though I have hope, yes. I've come, I be, I've become a practical cynic. It's... There are people who think this way or feel that way or behave this other way. And I, I've stopped trying to change them. What I try to do is offer a way of looking at the world that maybe they'll take, maybe they won't. Maybe as an educator, it's my job to make this as tasty as possible. So that, hey, that's a good idea. I never thought about it that way. But otherwise, you know, I just gave a presentation to a Christian school. K through 12, I talked about uh, optics. And at the end, it was open Q&A, and th they were 11th graders. And they started grilling me on 
science versus the Bible. And I, I said, I'm not here to stop you from being religious at all. Okay, we live in a country that protects your freedom to be religious and you're in a private school. So the government is not gonna come after you and say you have to get this out of the public coffers. I made that clear, but I didn't have the urge to try to convert them. And I get the sense that you, you've had this urge your entire life to convert people with no less zeal than a religious person, a religious um, a evangelical a religious person would have trying to convert people who are not that. Did I tell you, I didn't tell you this. We have a big bang theater here. Yes. And back when we first opened here at the Hayden Planetarium, um, there's a separate theater space where we just talk about the big bang. Someone came out of the big bang, saw me and says, how come you didn't mention God in there? And then I realized, okay, what am I gonna do? I say, how about this? Why don't you go to our hall of human evolution and then come back here? And when I tell them to do that, they never come back because that's way more offensive to them. Having you know, monkeys and humans yes. hold hands in the dioramas yes. than anything we could ever say in the Big Bang here. I thought they'd rather like Big Bang. I mean, the Big Bang sounds pretty much like Genesis. It's a creation event. Yeah. Yes. Maybe that's why they thought we should have mentioned God and didn't. But I, I just, I don't, I don't even have the conversation. I just send them over to your part of the museum. Yes. But I think you're being too pusillanimous. You, sh you shouldn't duck the question. In, um, well, I don't duck it so much as sometimes I don't have the energy. Oh, that's different. I, okay. I, I, I get that too. <laughs> you feel that? I understand that. <laughs> um, but in the in my field, that really is an absolute opposition. It's yes. not something you complete. Can... Uh, although the Catholic Church, they've met you in the middle. Yeah, yeah, they have. They but, said I mean, we have this branch of primates, and then God breathed the soul into right, them, yes, and, yes. and they're humans, allowing evolution all up to that point. Yeah, yeah. That's, you got, you got to give, give him some, you got to. No, not a, no. <laughs> not a step, not a step. <laughs> but the world is not that binary. It's not that binary. I don't see yes, it, it that is. way. There are religious people who are, per, who, where Jesus is their savior, but they're perfectly fine with a four and a half billion year old earth. Yes, they are. Okay. They're not at the extreme. They don't, so, they don't see the contradiction, but, but yes. So maybe the plurality of the world is a feature rather than a bug of the programming of what it is to be human. But the truth is so much more grand and so much more elegant and so much more poetic and so much uh, more beautiful. Why drag <laughs> Jesus in? And I would still claim you could get more of that across if people didn't feel stupid yeah, yeah. talking to you. Yeah, that, that's true.